come science. They might be trying to see come science. Hi, Dr. H here. This lesson will go over DNA replication. So if you remember uh, real briefly the structure of the DNA molecule, it is the double helix uh, as shown here in a sort of a 3D uh, ball and stick model. Um, and if we look a little closer at the two strands uh, over here on this side, uh, one of the striking features, uh, one that Watson and Crick actually noticed right away, is the complementary base pairs. Okay, adenine always pairs with thymine here, and guanine always pairs with cytosine. What Watson and Crick noticed right away about this, uh, what that means is that when you, if the two strands separate, the instructions for duplicating it, duplicating that strand and remaking the double helix is contained right there in the strand. Meaning that, so if we pull this strand away and we're left with only the A here, because of the base pairing rules, there has to be a T on the, on the next strand. And likewise over here, when we pull this strand away and we're left with a T, there has to be an A on the other side. So there's a nice self-consistent uh, instructions there for replicating itself, which they knew had to happen for the genetic material to be passed on during cell division. So Watson and Crick were wondering how does this DNA replicate itself? What is the mechanism? What's the model of replication? So they came up with three possible models here as they were sort of thinking about it. Uh, the first one here is what we call the semi-conservative model. Uh, and here we have the old DNA strand, the old DNA double helix here sort of in this dark red. And during replication, it gets made into two brand new daughter strands. In this model, the semi-conservative model, each new daughter DNA molecule is made up of one old strand here, the dark red side, and one new strand, which is in sort of this pink, light, very light pink, which you probably can barely even see. Um, so they thought, okay, that's one way it could work could also envision this sort of uh, this conservative model where each daughter DNA molecule, uh, well, this daughter DNA molecule is made up of two old strands, and this daughter molecule over here is made up of the two new strands of DNA, the two newly replicated, newly made strands. Um, and they also had this dispersive model, which they thought of, which uh, is very strange and each DNA molecule here, as you can see, it's kind of a mix of old DNA and new DNA kind of interspersed all together. Um, so the semi-conservative model here is the way it actually works. And how that was determined uh, was by experiments done by uh, Messelson and Stahl. And what they did, uh, some very, very elegant experiments, uh, they grew bacteria in culture media containing what is called heavy nitrogen. So this is N15, this dark red here. So this is, nit this is an isotope of nitrogen. It's a little bit heavier because it has the one extra neutron. Um, so the DNA, since the DNA contains so much nitrogen, turns out to be a little bit denser. So when you separate that DNA out on a density gradient, so more dense here, less dense up here, you get this nice heavy band. What they did was they took these uh, bacteria, this E. coli, which had been grown for 14 ge generations on this heavy nitrogen. So all of the nitrogen in the DNA is this heavier isotope. And then switched it to light nitrogen, N14, containing media. And they watched what happened to the density of the DNA. And after one round of replication, so one generation, one cell division, they saw all the DNA shifted to this uh, slightly lighter band here, slightly lighter form. After another generation, you had a little bit of this, of this slightly lighter form and then much more of, and then some of this even lighter form going up above. And then this slightly lighter form came more and more and this kind of intermediate form became less and less, but never actually, I don't believe it ever actually went away. Um, they did more than just four generations, I believe. 
Uh, and so from these data, and you can certainly go back in the textbook and they do a pretty good job of talking about this, this experiment and what they would have expected if the conservative model or the dispersive model were correct. But what these observations show was that the model is actually the semi-conservative model, that each new DNA strand, each, or sorry, each new DNA molecule is made up of one newly made strand. And so if you look at the first generation here, that would be the light nitrogen, okay, the sort of the yellowish orangey here. And then one strand is the old DNA strand. So that would be the dark red, the heavy nitrogen here. And that's why you saw, that's why after the first generation, all the DNA was the slightly lighter form. So it's a really very nice experiment. So how exactly does DNA replication work? Okay, DNA replication begins at these sites here called origins of replication. Okay, and these are little spots on the DNA chromosome um, where replication will begin. Uh, in simple organisms like bacteria, there'll be one origin uh, on the single chromosome. In eukaryotes, such as us, multiple origins per chromosome because we just have so much DNA that it needs to be replicated very quickly. We have to start it a bunch of times on each chromosome. So one of the first thing that first things that happens is these little origins open up, okay, and they form what's called a replication bubble. Okay, so here you see a replication bubble, and inside the bubble here is where the replication is beginning. So these dashed lines here, these dotted lines, are the actual, uh, is where the DNA is being replicated. Okay, and here you can see here, uh, this, another bubble over here opening up. So this bubble will be opening up that way. This bubble will be opening up the other way. And eventually, the two bubbles will meet. They'll kind of fuse. And then you're left with two newly made DNA strands, DNA molecules. And this portion right here, right where it's all opening up, this area is what's called the replication fork. Okay, and that's where really everything is kind of happening in replication right there at the replication fork. It's just important to remember that there are two replication forks per replication bubble. Okay, oftentimes when we look at what's happening in replication, we just focus on one fork and we can kind of forget that there's another fork on the opposite side of the bubble doing pretty much the same thing. So there's a number of enzymes, number of proteins involved in DNA, DNA replication. Uh, this is a list here of the ones that you should probably be aware of. Okay, I'll try to mention all of these as, as I go over them. Um, but it, you know, you should definitely uh, know all of these. I wouldn't be too worried about knowing the difference between polymerase one and three. Um, maybe just be aware that there are two types of polymerase that work during replication. I don't think it's so important to know which one does which. So one very important concept before we actually start going over replication is this idea of the anti-parallel nature of the two DNA strands. Okay, so there is a directionality to the DNA strands. Okay, there's a five prime end here, which uh, they don't really show it here, but it actually has a hydroxyl group. So I can draw an OH here. It's really not looking too well. So that, that's supposed to be a hydroxyl group in OH. And a three prime end down here that you can see has a free, has a phosphate group on the end of it. And then on the opposite strand, they're going in, on the other strand, they're going in the opposite direction. So here you have the three prime end, that's with the phosphate. And down here you have the five prime end, and that's with the hydroxyl. So they, this is what we call anti-parallel. Okay, they're kind of going opposite ways. Okay, it's very, very important because of the chemistry of adding a base to the DNA molecule. Okay, the enzyme uh, DNA polymerase here, which actually catalyzes the polymerization of the nucleic acid of the DNA molecule, can only add nucleotides to a hydroxyl group. Okay, it can only add to the five prime end here or 
here. Okay, cannot add to the free phosphate. Okay, and there's lots of reasons for this. Um, and we're not going to go into, but it can only add here. So the base, the the polymer can only be extended in one direction. Be extended in that direction, or in that direction. Now it becomes very important. We start talking about the two strands, and we'll talk about that right here. Okay, so here we have. Remember, this is just one side of the replication bubble. So this is uh, all of this here would be one replication fork. Okay, that's all the one fork there. Okay, so some of the enzymes. Let's talk about some of them. So uh, helicase. This one comes in. It's kind of signified as this. That uh, acts to unwind the double helix. Okay, it comes in pulls the strands apart, makes these single-stranded DNA areas. And then this protein here, these little purple guys come in, and this is uh, single-stranded binding proteins. They come in, kind of coat this, this single-stranded region uh, to prevent them from just re rebase pairing. Because if you get two DNA sequence, two DNA strands that are complementary, they'll just go right back together, because that is energetically favorable to them. Okay, and while we're talking about all that, we should talk about this enzyme over here called topoisomerase. This actually sits probably a little bit further away from the replication, replication fork than what they're showing here, um, but whatever. Um, that enzyme is very important. It, if you ever, um, you know, had you pull out your earbuds and they're all tangled up and you just try to pull them apart, um, you know that the you know you're trying to get all the tangles out. You know just just by pulling them, the tangles actually get worse on either end. Okay, and that that's what would happen to the DNA molecule if helicase was just allowed to pull the, the helixes apart, the helices apart. Uh, it would you would have what we call positive overwinding up here. So this topoisomerase here actually unwinds that. Okay, I think it, it believe it actually makes a little break in the DNA molecule and spins it around really, really fast. Okay, and helicase actually un unwinds it pretty pretty quickly also. So topoisomerase is very important. It, re it releases that positive overwinding, which is a little bit upstream of the, uh, or I guess that'd be downstream because we're heading that way. I guess that'd be downstream of the replication fork. All right, so here we have the leading strand, okay? Uh, let's see, the template strand, the old strand here. This is the three prime end, um, five prime end of the new strand. So on the leading strand, the DNA polymerase enzyme can add nucleotides right to this growing chain here. Okay, so the DNA polymerase will be moving that way towards the replication fork. Okay, so DNA polymerase jumps on, starts trucking that way, and can just move right along following helicase, and everything is fine down here on this, what we call the leading strand. Okay, and that's getting a little messy, so let's get rid of all that. On the other strand, okay, what we call the lagging strand, okay, because of the directionality, this is now going in the opposite direction. Okay, so as the DNA is unwound, the DNA polymerase can't add to this end of the molecule. Okay, so DNA polymerase can't move towards the fork. It actually has to move away from the fork. So the way this works, uh, it helicase unwinds a little bit. This enzyme here called DNA primase comes in and synthesizes a very, very short RNA primer. They show it as just a single nucleotide here, which is a little bit mis a little bit misleading. Uh, it's actually usually probably like five to ten nucleotides. But the reason that that RNA primer sits there is that DNA polymerase cannot just start making a DNA molecule. It, it can only attach nucleotides to an already existing molecule. So it has to have something there. So it just makes a short little RNA piece, and then polymerase comes in and begins adding. So it, so here's an RNA primer. DNA polymerase moved that way and added little pieces. And then another RNA primer is formed after helicase unwound it a little bit. 
RNA polymerase made this little piece. And then there's another primer showing up right here, which seems a little close, and it's going to make another little piece. And these little fragments are what are called Okazaki fragments, okay, and the little pieces of DNA. And this is all because of that directionality, because of the anti-parallel nature of the DNA strands. Okay, and then this last enzyme, DNA ligase, comes in and stitches all those Okazaki fragments together, links them all together into one continuous DNA strand. Okay, and we'll watch some animations of this in class, and that hopefully will make it a little bit clearer. So that's the basic model of replication. Um, now, a few little details here. Because of the, the necessity of the, uh, the RNA primers, there's a problem at the end of linear chromosomes, such as we have in humans. So here, uh, if we just look at this side here, here's our last RNA primer at the very end of the chromosome, okay? After that is removed, because we don't want little pieces of RNA within our DNA chromosome, so those are removed and replaced with DNA, you have this area here which was not replicated. And there's nothing out here to make another RNA primer, okay? We can't make a piece of RNA here. So there's no way for DNA polymerase to come in and fill in all of that area there. So that means that the chromosomes, that this end of each chromosome, this is this the end, the other end of the chromosome here, also showing the same problem, uh, would get shorter each time the DNA is replicated. Each cell division, the chromosomes would get a little bit shorter because you cannot replicate the ends. So the way the cell deals with this is by adding something called a telomere. Okay, and a telomere is a repetitive sequence. Here, I believe this is the uh, sequence for a human telomere that's added on to the ends of the chromosomes. This means that the chromosomes can shorten and you none of the important information down here, any uh, gene coding DNA or any regulatory DNA won't get lost. The only thing that will, be get, that will get lost is this extra sequence here, uh, the, the telomere. Okay, and there's this enzyme here called telomerase, which is active in, cell, in some cells, which adds these nucleotides onto to the telomere and lengthens, lengthens them and keeps them to the right length. And there, is, there may be some link between telomerase activity and telomere length and aging and death. Uh, so it's a very interesting area of research. Um, but that is basically DNA replication. So hope that made sense. Dropping science like Galileo dropped the orange.